Anyway, let's watch this. The Boondocks. To parody and criticize commercialized ideas of blackness is an inherent part of its DNA. We were back in the comic strip, critiquing the media for how it depicts black. Oh shit! We got an oi bruv. We got oi bruv. Yeah. We got oi bruv. Yeah. That's right. An oi bruv. He's gonna be talking about Boondocks. Yeah. It's one of my favorite cartoons in one of my favorite comics. Yeah. Let's go. Black people, but also in what those ideas specifically entail. You know, take Riley. Riley's one of the Boonox's less subtle characters. And while there's a subset of people out there who can't get past his coarse language and sometimes identify with his homophobia, I mean... Which I mean... <laughs> I mean, that's on you. But the Boonox has a lot to say about commercialization and how it bleeds into our depiction of blackness and even our general ideas of success. Let's talk about it. Who is they? I don't see nobody but you, nigga. I'm telling you, granddad, I know exactly how to handle this. They want to go to war, I'll take them niggas to war. Riley, like Huey, is conceptually founded on a specific era of hip-hop, the political era of the late 80s and the gangster rap of the 90s. These are the two threads defining Huey and Riley, hip-hop. According to Aaron, the Boonots was always, at its core, a hip-hop strip. Huey's a product of Public Enemy, KRS-One, Brand Nubian and more, whereas Riley's a bit more Tupac, Nas, Jay-Z, you know, that kind of energy. Look, I like look, I like both for different reasons. I'm not I'm not picking favourites, but Fear of a Black Nation is one of my favourite albums of all time, so I don't know. Huey's politics are very much influenced by the music Aaron consumed in his upbringing. It's not even a question, dude. It's just it's not even a question, it's Huey. Ridiculous. And it's also like Aaron Magruder is also, I think, more so Huey. That's why he's like the That's why he's the fucking uh, like the main character. He's more of a main character. My political perspectives as a young adult were shaped by hip hop's political era, which was 1987 to 1992, roughly when I was in junior high and high school. We had Public Enemy, KRS One, X Clan, Bland Nubian, and all these overtly political groups. It was more than that. It was actual black nationalism. It was radical. I relate more to Riley. Yeah, we know. Eve made me. Fucking three years in this community, dude. Yeah, we know, bro. You didn't have to say that. <laughs> uh, but did you know that it's also top of the fucking hour? And I totally forgot to run a 60 second ad break. God damn, dude. <clears throat> if you'd like to no longer see the ads though, it's okay. You can subscribe for four dollars is twenty percent off on September, or for free with a Twitch Prime, or you can use an ad block or a VPN. There there are many different ways you can avoid the ad breaks. But the ad breaks are coming. All right. They're coming right now. Okay, here's the ad now. Socialism. There was no black leadership supplying these political ideals to the next generation. And what very few people there were, a lot of us, particularly those who grew up in the suburbs, discovered that through hip hop. It's why Haru Otomo was a DJ. It's why Caesar was originally supposed to be an MC and a hip hop connoisseur. It's only too bad they didn't. Hip hop bleeds into the strip, it bleeds into the show, and it's the driving force because of how varied it is and what specifically it tackles. Riley's character, then, is a response to the gangster rap of the 90s. Aaron talks a lot about wanting to parody these things when he thought of the concept in 1993. Everything in hip hop was street and ghetto and hard. I didn't want to be fake. There's a certain number of black people from the suburbs who really pretend like they're living in the sea. It's this notion that you're only truly black if you're from the city and you're poor. He set the boonocks in a white neighborhood because that's where I came from and that's why I knew. Riley's character is naturally a product of the media he consumes. He's a product of commercialized blackness sold to him by the media. And when you commercialize specific depictions of blackness, it serves a dual purpose. One, when you push a specific image of blackness and it's mostly negative, people are naturally going to have a negative image of black people. There's a lot of white and even non-white people that don't actually have a lot of black friends. So their only idea of blackness comes from the things they consume. And if all you consume is propaganda surrounding how ignorant and needlessly violent our culture is, that's all you're going to think of us. You can't be the proud, noble fighter when ever- The irony is that when I lived in Turkey and there's no black people in Turkey, the media that was like as like the media that that helped me understand, which is so stupid to say, I know, but it's impossible for you to comprehend this because you've never lived in a country where there's no black people. At most, you've lived in a racist country where there's segregated communities. But living in Turkey with no black people, like Aaron Magruder, Magruder was was really 
Right? He was instrumental in me understanding um, the African American experience. It's so dumb to fucking explain it like this. And obviously, there were still a ton of um, what's the right word? There was a ton of, of, of areas that I did not comprehend until I actually came to America. LMAO, why are there no blacks in Turkey? Think about it. Think about it. Information gaps was what I was thinking of. Yes, by the way. Thank you. I may said blacks. What did some countries engage in? For a very long time, that increased their black population that maybe other countries did not engage in to the same degree. Think about it. Turks have black slaves. That's why I already qualified that slavery of of uh, african people was not as widespread or as commonplace in the ottoman empire in comparison to chattel slavery that was a driving force of the western economy Turks, for the most part went after white slaves slavery was also different like it's completely different in the ottoman empire than than um, how it was in the South. First, that Greeks and Armenians were slaves? No, it was Balkans. Greeks too, and Balkans. Turks did the Armenian genocide. As far as like slavery goes, they were, uh, they, they heavily enslaved people in the Balkans. The Janissaries were basically Christian slaves for the army. So that's the reason why I said it's different. Because when you're a slave in Western society, you have no power, you are enslaved, and you are not seen as a human being. When you were a Janissary, you were literally elevated to the highest levels of Ottoman society. You had the opportunity to fucking uh, engage in mass action against the, the empire when you felt like you weren't paid enough. Kazan Kaldermak is a famous thing. Like, they would literally take these massive fucking cauldrons full of food and they would flip them over and refuse and, and do, like, work stoppages. Um, the Dave Schiedman program that I've talked about before would take you and, and parents would literally give their children. It, there was it's slavery, but also at the same time, parents would also want their children to go into the Dave Schiedman program if they were from, like, a fucking faraway village or a neighborhood because... A lot of the top level aristocrats and uh, like incredibly famous people in Ottoman in the Ottoman Empire were literally Dev Shirme. Janissaries formed a high military former slave class similar to Mamluks. Yeah. So like. Are you seriously trying to whitewash child slavery? No, of course not. But to consider it the same as like uh, chattel slavery in the United States, it would be idiotic and ahistorical. So giving you the actual context of the um, different types of, of like child slavery and whatnot is I think still something you should uh, benefit from. I'm not making an endorsement of the program itself. But I think you would understand that, like, the way that the way that black people are being treated in the United States of America is a little different than the way that the Dave Schumer program operated, right? Slavery is still bad, immoral, abhorrent. That does not change. This chat is so dumb today. No, my chat is always dumb. The reason why we started this conversation was why are there no black people in Turkey? There is a very, very small group of Afro Turks in Izmir, in, or maybe not in Izmir, but in Ege. Okay, that have been they have been in Turkey. They've been in Turkey for many, many generations. But outside of that, but outside of that, there are like there aren't. Is it in Mula? Yeah. 
My man out here like a slavery weeb diving, uh, deep diving into the lore for chat. I mean, it's, it's bad, but someone asked me why there weren't black people in Turkey and I'm already fucking explaining why there wasn't black people in Turkey. And then someone talked about the slavery, uh, chattel slavery and someone in the chat literally said, well, Turks had black slaves too. So I'm just explaining it. I'm explaining, I'm giving you the nitty and the gritty. Sweden has no black people. Doesn't mean they are not racist. I mean, I never said Turkey is not racist either. Like, I don't know why you, bro, people are so weird. Like you just like, you had a whole ass fucking argument in your own head with me, I guess. And you're making a point that no one is defending. Like you're just, just keep it up, brother. Just keep arguing with yourself, uh, assuming that I'm making arguments against it or something. Yeah, but you had to change your religion, denounce your heritage, and people only wanted to send their children to service. Janissaries already turned Muslim, Albanians and Bosnians. Blood tax was still a thing, certainly better than what Americans did, though. Yup, that's true. Everything that you said is is uh, correct. But as I was saying, like, Mimar Sinan, uh, the most famous architect in Ottoman Empire history is uh, Dev Shireman. There's plenty of, uh, like, so many of the, uh, so many of the most famous, like, people that were elevated to the highest fucking uh, ranks of society were from that same exact program. The program of child slavery. Why are we comparing acts of slavery? I think it's a, I think it's interesting historically. Like it's really fucking interesting because you would have absolutely never, you would have absolutely never known that. Like, why are you fucking sad that you're learning about a new thing? It's such a strange thing to get upset about, dude. Dude, why the fuck are you teaching us shit? Fuck you, dude! What the fuck, dude? Alright, let's go back to this video. Every single time someone sees a person that looks like you on television, they're acting like a damn fool. How would they know? How would they know you're not a damn fool? Do they're gonna talk to you? Yeah, right. Two, the other purpose it serves is annihilating those political perspectives in the first place or at least focusing them within the framework of the system. All that radical socialism, black nationalist politics, I mean that, I mean that, that's dangerous. That's explicitly what the COINTELPRO plan was specifically against. What essence would there be in pushing music that promotes rebellion against the system? You know, to, to hell with that. It's similar to why the education system doesn't explicitly tell black people about their history, outside the whitewashed liberal pacifism of Martin Luther King. There's no incentive to, because if you create a generation of black youth uneducated about their history, they're much more likely Bro, this dude is awesome. The storyteller is fucking dope. Whoever this person is, they're sick. To remain docile, not rebel against it. In every sense of the word, it's conditioning. Commercial blackness is the way you act, it's the way you speak. But honestly speaking, I think it's a lot more than rampant homophobia and misogyny though. I think it's our perceived ideas of success. You get a peek into this mind frame with characters like Riley and Jasmine. But to understand this point, you need to understand the similarities between Riley and Jasmine and the perception of success. What do you think? I think he just- I gotta stop making fun of oi, uh, oi bruvs and free heads. Rip you off. But you think ponies grow on trees? What kind of question is that? It's a large four-legged mammal. Riley I'll get into a bit more later. But Jasmine and her family specifically tends to be used as a vehicle to facilitate the point regarding black people within the system. Tom Dubois is a play on W.E.B. Du Bois' double consciousness theory, and it bleeds into Jasmine's depiction as well. I think something people tend to misunderstand is before the much more overt ruckus, Tom Dubois was the original Uncle Tom of the series. His hatred of self is a lot more subtle than ruckus, but it's small things like the fact that Dubois is given a French pronunciation, or his obsession with his Eurocentric heritage. All of this bleeding into his inability to help or support Jasmine, dealing with her struggles of accepting her blackness. He's a spineless democrat who believes with enough peaceful protests and campaigning within the system, things can truly change from the bell. And you see what's interesting is, Jasmine reflects this philosophy quite well too. The block is hot as an easy target, but it illustrates perfectly a complete belief in the system at play. You'll never get anywhere in this world without doing a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. 
Jasmine, Ed's never going to give you that pony. She completely buys into this idea that if she plays to the system well enough, someday she'll be successful. Just like Tom Dubois believed that if he plays to the system well enough, he can make change. And where does that leave him? Tom is framed for murder and he's held captive by prisoners and abandons the kids. Jasmine ends up getting her labor exploited by Ed Wansler. And even in the fundraiser, when Riley passes her and she reveals she sold $5,000 worth of chocolate. I mean, what's she, I mean, what's she getting? <laughs> A keychain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Aw oh, man, you doing that? You don't even get to keep none of the money. When they make the hair care product that gives people long Eurocentric hair, who clings to it? Tom and Jasmine. Their idea of success is whiteness. It's a subconscious battle that many black people go through, but in the words of James Baldwin, whiteness is a metaphor for power. There's this internalized self-hating idea that if you don't have something tied to European heritage, ideas or appearance, you are nothing. Historically, people used to try and buy whiteness just so they could be seen as equal. Irish people were victims of discrimination but assimilated into the labour of whiteness as a form of protection. Theodore W. Allen took a decade to produce a book called The Invention of the White Race. The first two generations of seen as data in Virginia observes that there were no people that actually identified as white. The people that we now come to think of as white were defined by other factors, like the region of Europe they came from. He goes on to talk about how ancestors of European Americans started to be defined as white as a response to labor solidarity between African and European Americans in 1696. The Bacon's Rebellion. It was a multiracial rebellion against the British governor. It was only after this that European elites began issuing privileges to people based on their skin color, like privileged positions in a plantation economy, making it illegal to whip a white Christian, and even making it illegal for a black person to own and employ a white person. Because while white people don't have a monopoly on oppression, and hierarchies run by people other than white people exist with very similar features, it doesn't remove from the fact that whiteness from its inception in slave colonies was a supremacist identity, completely founded on what it was not. When white nationalists come through and they start talking about protecting whiteness, it's about maintaining the white supremacist power structure, whether they realize it or not. Don't get it twisted, whiteness is a metaphor for power. Pro-black doesn't mean anti-white, no, it, it kind of does. And those that don't recognize that don't have a firm idea of what whiteness historically truly means. Money whitens, therefore poverty darkens. And when you're talking about money, it's really difficult to ignore a character like Riley. Oh shit. Wait, hold on. And that's precisely how... And that's precisely why... Like... White nationalists are able to fucking hide their, their nefarious agenda under the auspices of whiteness by turning around and talking about how like, well, black people can do black power. Why can't we do white power? Well, it's different. Like blackness as a concept is one that was built in exclusion. One that was built out of necessity, a collective identity, especially like African-Americans, black culture. White people know where the fuck they're from. A lot of black people don't, you know, because they were robbed of that. Something I always bring up regularly whenever people try to, whenever people try to fucking have this conversation about like reverse racism or whatever the fuck. Riley's a lot different but it adheres to many similar ideas. Riley's imitation isn't of white people, but the often derogatory image corporations push of blackness. It comes with hyper masculinity, it comes with homophobia, but it also comes with this desire for money and power for the sake of social mobility. Jasmine and Tom Dubois imitate whiteness overtly, in name, in appearance, and specifically in their desire to work for white people. Give their labor to the system. Riley doesn't want to work for anyone, he wants to own it. And on paper, this isn't inherently problematic. Wanting to own your own work isn't a problem. You see a lot of how Riley would operate in this context in the fundraiser. When he achieves this level of success, Riley doesn't forget about his family. He doesn't neglect his friends or the people who got him to where he was. I love to see my niggas on TV shining, cause when they shine, I shine. Sort of. Even Huey, despite being the one doubting all his plans and ideas, is a small detail but in the scene before the car blows up, you can see Riley bought him a new jacket. It's not just about success, it's about elevating those around you with your success. Supposedly. But say when this kid comes in, attacked and covered in chocolate, what does Riley do? Let's get, I mean, who cares? Deal with it. Let's get back to making money. Those hair care products might blow up people's heads, but hey, you know, we're, we're making money. <laughs> we got money to make. He completely neglects the people working under him and the people that might be exploited as a consequence of his own action. It doesn't matter to him, he's making money. And while Riley isn't seeking whiteness as overtly as characters like Jasmine and Tom Dubois, his pursuit of power quietly does speak to it. Let's compare this to something on a larger scale, which the Bunos has openly criticized. That's why this is one of the best shows ever created, because 
it's just completely diametrically opposed to capitalism and uh follows along the the famous fred hampton quote of uh you cannot defeat racism with black capitalism you can only defeat it with socialism i butchered that but bt the bt episodes of the boonox openly criticize the network for exploiting black people and thus having a negative impact on their perception of themselves and the perception white people have on them you expect white television to portray black people a particular way. I guess the, the anger comes from black television portraying us a particular way. That brings out a different sense of frustration. And I think at the heart of these episodes is that frustration. The BT is an example. I don't think I've ever seen that episode. What the fuck? The BT episode is banned? You know, I had the UMDs for this and the Chappelle show. I had the fucking UMDs for these. Those were the two shows. Those are the two only TV shows that I had UMDs for, for my PSP. Yeah, that's right, dude. Chatters are like, what the fuck's a UMD? Yeah, exactly. I have it downloaded and can upload to Google Drive if you want. Yeah, I, I would love to watch it. I want it it's still on HBO Max, the BET episode two. And the one about Tyler Perry too, really? ...of how effectively a black capitalist can exploit black people. It's reprehensible because it completely takes advantage of its audience. There's a limited amount of spaces where black people can actively support black people. Something with black faces that's genuinely black owned. <laughs> hey, well, <laughs> I mean, that one, that one might not even be true. But the point I'm making by comparing these facets of blackness is how they all seek power through monetary gain in one way, shape or form. For him, the black man, there is only one way out and it leads into the white world. Whence his constant preoccupation with attracting the attention of the white man, his concern with being powerful like the white man, his determined effort to acquire protective qualities. That is the bro watching the boonocks with his white ass chat just be prepared for his stunlocks. I don't think so. I think boondocks is like good as fuck for a white ass chat to watch. I mean, dude, I was I'm Turkish. You know, that's how I that was like a important introduction for me for black culture. That's what got me interested, you know? Yo, don't share media like that through the drive, bro. Tell this chatter. I don't, why, why not? I don't know. Oh, are they fucking tracking it? The guy runs this channel, describes himself as black socialist. Oh God. I'm scared to fucking, I'm scared to scroll down on his fucking timeline and then see him fucking shitting all over me like yo this guy's racist as fuck fuck this guy you know what i mean yeah he's dope i love this video i, I love it a lot it's really cool the proportion of being or having that which enters into the composition of an ego is from within that the negro will seek admittance into the white sanctuary ego withdrawal as a successful defense mechanism is impossible for the negro he requires a white approval but I'm essentially communicating that this rationalization of human suffering is often done through this end. It's not as overt, but as long as the people around you and the people you like are happy, then apparently, look, none of that- Buying a house that big was kind of a Riley move, not gonna lie. Oh my god, shut up. That shit matters. Maybe some white people will see it and maintain big eared opinions about black people. Who cares? Okay, maybe I have a little bit of Riley in me too. Okay. It makes money. Maybe some straight people will hear the language and perpetuate the cycle of homophobia. Who cares? People find it entertaining. It sounds powerful in my music. The ways in which we rationalize exploitation and blur the lines between strategy and exploitation is something that's specifically explored quite well with Rollo Goodlove. It's fascinating, but it's something the Boonox explores quite often. It's more than the music. It's the networks. It's the leaders. It's the media. The exploitation of black people from the white media and the black capitalists who wish to exploit the suffering of black people for profit. Seeking nothing but power and profit. Imitating their oppressors. Don't get it twisted. Whiteness is a metaphor for power. Going back to that previous point, we have to ask, why is blackness so commercialized? Even if it's a very specific image. Well, I think it's profitable. You can create some interesting perpetual cycles in doing so. If you sell them violence and crime, then they'll probably end up like Riley and end up in jail. If you sell them false dreams, they'll probably end up like Jasmine, confused and exploited. And as long as the prominent black figures are there to facilitate these narratives, then nothing is going to change. You see, black people are sold a lot of false ideas, and the only thing we have to pay in return is the price. 
and a lot of the time, the price is all we have to show for it. This weaponization of blackness has been strategically used against us. I think that TikTok girl was saying she gave laundry a ride was telling the truth. The spot she named is less than 10 miles away from where they found the body. No way. So they fucking gave... So you think they gave her a ride after he, like, got done doing fucking, you know, doing the deed? Us. But it doesn't have to her own car to be this way. You see, the only reason it's being used in such a way is because there's so much inherent value in blackness as a concept. By making whiteness the color of oppression, the color that defined people's rights to own human beings, to rape, kill, and steal with impunity, white supremacists have paradoxically opened the way for blackness to become the color of freedom, of revolution, and of humanity. This paradoxical idea is perhaps another factor into why black people are pushed into the forefront of pop culture. Because while people are conditioned to seek power, you certainly can't relate to it. And it's through our knowledge of this paradox that we're reminded through the show that we should be responsible with the images we put out and the ideas we sell to people. And that isn't exclusive to any form of media consumption. Because as illustrated, blackness is commercialized in music, in food, in news outlets, in networks, in corporations, and much, much more. These profit-driven perceptions of blackness cause us more harm than good because they aren't framed around honesty. They aren't sincere. If blackness is truly the color of freedom, revolution, and humanity, then the blackest thing you can do is be true to yourself in service of your people. To be real, it's more than your family. It's more than your friends. It's about recognizing the impact you have on a community. And it's harder than you think, but it has to be done because while there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, you can't allow yourself to be consumed by the politics of power and profit because you'll not only lose sight of yourself and your own reality, but you'll openly be exploiting the same people you claim to support. And Damn, Andrew, Andrew beat you to the punch, chat. Oh, never mind. He didn't actually. He fucking literally didn't. He was texting me. That's not a wait. Is this Andrew? Is this actually the baby cup? It's new channel five videos released. Oh my God, dude, you got me. He just texted me literally just now. So I thought there was a new video and I looked it up and it was like, no, it's actually about something different. Fucking asshole fucking debated me. And don't be surprised if it comes back to bite you later. So stay true to your the Obama song. Was that dick riding Obama? Was that the boondocks Obama song? The irony is that there is literally a song that is not like dick riding Obama, but the actual song is like da -da 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 Obama. What was it? It was like a white lady who like I've got a crush on Obama. I think that's what it was called. yourself and stay true to others because you never know who's watching and you never know who you can help along the way hey look, look here brother can you spare uh some money for a starving africa hey you never know when you might need some good karma now first rule of fundraising don't give nothing to nobody your blackness isn't something to be ashamed of it isn't a weapon to be used against you it's a vehicle for sparking change in the lives of others and whether that's a vehicle to facilitate revolution, financial freedom, or humanity, well, that's for you to decide, not me. Unjambo, good luck to you. This is a bruv, mate. It took me about 10 to 15 bruvophobia of mild annoyance. Now it's funny. Did I beat it into you? Bro, France literally pulled their ambassadors out of, out of the United States and Australia because they couldn't sell their submarines to Australia, okay? These motherfuckers are the most proud hon, 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 wee wee baguette motherfuckers out there, dude. Like, they just lose their shit. I mean, think about Quebec. Literally, look at Quebec, okay? The average Quebecer has so much French in them that they also have that same exact type of pettiness and pride. It's just something about fucking... It's just something about French people that just, like... Damn, this dude just like breaks down a lot of uh, a lot of black concepts through the boondocks. Black media is too political. It's not black escapism. Too much black trauma. Cancel culture. Black power. It's pretty sick. 
Hey, if you like this video, please subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. <laughs>